The story of how modern Britain was created isn't just about kings, queens and politicians. It's about how we learnt to farm, to trade and to live together. It's about how war, new gods and new learning shaped life on these islands. Using clues from the everyday lives of men and women, this series tells the story of how Britain and its people have been transformed from the Stone Age to the Industrial Revolution. This is the story of the first age of Britain. It tells of a struggle between man and the environment. It begins in 6000 BC with a few people learning to survive on the edges of hostile forests. It ends 4000 years later with them dominating the landscape with monuments that stand to this day. The island of Britain exists because of global warming. About 10,000 years ago, the ice sheets that covered most of the Northern Hemisphere began to melt. Temperatures were going up. Sea levels were rising. Britain was still a peninsula joined to the European landmass, but that was about to change forever. Every year, the land bridges that connected us to continental Europe grew narrower. Mile after mile of hunting grounds were submerged. And then, around 6000 BC, the last finger of land that joined us to northern France disappeared underwater. Planet Earth had a new island. And for the people caught on it, the first age of Britain had begun. For modern Britons, the Stone Age people who lived here 8,000 years ago can seem remote and unknowable. It's easy to imagine they're nothing like us, but strip away our clothes and technology and we are identical. They weren't the sort of people going ugh, ugh and walking around and, and hairy. They were highly intelligent. Everything that, if, if you put them here today, they might find things a bit different, but they would have our brain capacity our ability to reason, our ability to talk, our ability to communicate. So they're not different in any way at all. They're us. The people who lived here 8,000 years ago were hunter-gatherers. They moved according to the seasons, hoarding stores of fur, game and nuts at base camps, tapping delicacies like birch syrup straight from trees. They didn't have permanent settlements. They didn't cultivate crops. They didn't farm animals. They hadn't yet worked out how to make pots. It was a way of life that had been very successful, but now it was under threat. The global warming that had created the island of Britain was having a dramatic effect on their environment. For 40,000 years, the people in Northern Europe were used to living in wide open spaces. Then, around the time that Britain became an island, their habitat completely changed. Now what they had to deal with was dense, impenetrable forest. Oak, birch and hazel took a thousand years to cover the country. But an individual hunter-gatherer would have seen his local hunting grounds overrun in a few short years. People are having to deal with this change, and this is a very new thing. This won't have happened before. I mean, we, we don't know how they reacted to woodlands psychologically, but they would have been probably quite scary places. You could wander around in a piece of woodland like this and be lost in minutes. There, there are no points in the landscape to give you any idea where you are, it is almost impossible. 
You're tangled in the barbed wire almost of the, of the undergrowth. It's, it's nasty and I think that's what makes it hostile to people. As the trees spread, the archaeological evidence suggests the human population halved. Something in the alien world of the forest, whether it was new diseases or new challenges, was killing people off. There's not a lot of food in a wood other than the animals themselves, and it's very difficult to see those animals. So if you're going to go hunting, you'll go hunting in those areas where you've got a relatively good view of what it is you're trying to catch. So this isn't the place to do it. So to make a success of their world, hunter-gatherers left for the far fringes of the country. This is the tiny island of Oransay off the west coast of Scotland. Coastal areas are relatively open and the sea a rich source of food. Hunter-gatherer family groups of around 20 came here in simple boats every year at designated times. Dotted around the island, just below the surface, archaeologists found thousands of burnt hazelnut shells and telltale scorch marks, the traces of prehistoric campfires, all in the shadow of these strange-looking hillocks. Hunter-gatherers were very particular about where they put their rubbish. Because groups kept on coming back to the same spot year in, year out, this midden that I'm standing on is the result. In effect, it's a giant rubbish tip packed with Stone Age waste. Everything would have gone in here. When it was excavated, what was left were mainly limpet shells and fish bones that had clearly been eaten. But there were two human teeth and even the remains of a human hand. Humans were clinging precariously to Britain around 8,000 years ago. Archaeologists call this era the Mesolithic or Middle Stone Age. There's evidence for about 1,500 campsites across the whole country from this time, and our best guess is that the population numbered a few hundred thousand. But somehow people survived. They might not have lived in the woods, but they quickly learned how to exploit them. In fact, this would be better described as the wood rather than the Stone Age, but wooden artefacts aren't as tenacious as their stone counterparts. Well, really, I think the thing that Near Lewis in East Sussex, archaeologists are trying to rebuild a hunter-gatherer home. It's based on one that existed 9,000 years ago in Northern Ireland. The original structure is long gone, but the rotting wood did leave clues as to how it was built. So obviously the outer cover isn't going to survive or leave any real record. Right. But these posts, uh -huh. which are radiating round in a nice circle, being driven down probably about that far below ground level, and that will rot away. And you'll actually have a darker coloured soil filling in where it's gone into the ground. And from that we can see the depth, we can see the width, and also as importantly we can see that they were angled, telling us that the building came in. Rather than having a sort of straight sides or whatever, the building actually comes in together. This hut is known as a bender dwelling because the frame is made of flexible hazel saplings that have been bent into a dome. We can't be sure what the walls were filled in with, but it's likely that something plentiful and insulating like heather was used. Chances are you've got two or three buildings around as well, so it's not the only building maybe up to 20 to 25 people is a sort of minimum number to make a community work. And how many people would have lived in here when it was first built? In one of these, five or six people in here. OK. Can fit in very snugly, maybe even more. Yeah. Going in helped me imagine the intimate and organised world of the hunter-gatherers. If you're in this building, there's an awful lot of chemistry and magic just in the light. Yes, yeah. Um, when you go into a modern room and you turn on a switch, and what have you got? You've got the whole room flooded with light. We take for granted, and it doesn't, there's no chemistry to it, there's no magic to it. I tell you the thing I'm very surprised by is this kind of fire guard around the hearth. Mm. That wasn't, it doesn't feel very Mesolithic, but <laughs> obviously it is. It, it's there in the record, there are holes around the hearth. A number of possibilities spring to mind. One is it's a very good fire guard, and if you're a hunter gatherer community, ensuring that your, your little people grow up to be big hunter gatherers and support you in, in, 
in your elder years is very important. So keeping them out of the fire, and it does that very well. Mm. Archaeologists used original tools, like this 8,000-year-old flint axe head in the hut's construction. Flint is extremely common in southern England, and careful working can produce an edge that's as sharp as any modern-day surgical blade. Is that what you were aiming for? That, that's exactly what I was aiming for. This beautiful, long, very sharp yes. blade came off. Oh, it's amazingly sharp, isn't it's it? It's extremely sharp. Individuals amassed their own collections of painstakingly produced precision tools. This period, they're also making tiny little things. These are called microliths. They're pieces of flint that have been struck off extremely carefully. It's a very, very controlled process. Sometimes you'll find little faults or flaws, or you'll see where they made a mistake. Yeah. Um, so it's a very exciting way of really engaging with that individual from, like you say, 8,000 years ago. Tiny stone blades like these were turned into arrowheads, harpoon points and knives. So with a long blade, you can do something like this. This is a knife, beautifully long blade, but we can protect it and secure it by putting it in a mixture of beeswax and pine resin. Very sticky, very strong, and this is our sort of prehistoric glue. Britain's hunter-gatherers were learning to adapt to the forest, and it was bringing out their inventiveness. In the Mesolithic, we see the first appearance of a weapon so deadly that it would reign supreme for nearly 8,000 years. The bow and arrow. The bow was invented probably to bring down smaller, quicker animals in a forest situation. It's very difficult to throw a spear when you're surrounded by dense undergrowth. I think it's a lot easier to use a bow when you've got accuracy and speed of the arrow. But also, you've got the option of hiding up trees and taking out your prey from there. And it'd be quite difficult to throw a spear from a tree without falling out yourself. A precious tiny number of Stone Age bows have survived. And Stuart Pryor has copied one that was found preserved in a bog in Denmark. And this is a replica that you've made? This is, this is about 7,000 BC, and this is called a self-bow. It's made from a single piece of wood, and it's, yeah, it's an incredibly uh, developed weapon. This is a, uh, uh, this is a bow from about 3,000 BC. Um, in actual fact, interestingly enough, the technology involved in this bow isn't as good as the earlier 7,000 BC weapon. Yeah? So it's almost like the technology's going backwards, because the people that were using this one were farmers. So because these people relied on hunting for their livelihood, obviously the technology needed to be that much, you know, that much better. The medieval longbow is much fatter than the hunter-gatherer bow. This means it's easy to mass produce. The flat hunter-gatherer bow takes hours of careful crafting, but it's lighter, easier to carry and more powerful. Their arrowheads were tiny flint microliths. Often there was an extra barb, making this a truly nasty and effective weapon. We compared the power of the bows by using them to fire arrows into a dead pig, a similar target to the wild boar that were hunted in the Stone Age. The medieval bow was ineffective. The second attempt was no better. The hunter-gatherer bow was lethal. Yes! <laughs> Hunter-gatherers must have passed on information and stories about their world. There would have been myths and memories but also oral knowledge essential for the next generation's survival. At this time, our most common foods like potatoes, wheat and rice were unknown. And tiny burnt fragments around hearths show that people were experimenting with other ways of getting essential nutrients. These customers, which may not look very appetizing now, these are one of our most important sources of, of starch. These are the rhizomes, or the bits that go underground from the bulrush, from, from the reed mace. And if you have a look in the heart of it, can you see it's nice and soft and white? Mm. That's almost pure starch. Very, very important food source. Now, 
You can eat it straight off. It's much, much better when it's being cooked. Mm. Put it in the fire, 15, 20 minutes. And Stone Age equivalent of marshmallows. <laughs> <laughs> They're tasty. <laughs> better come out better than they look now. <laughs> yeah, they don't look appetizing. They don't, like nor that. do they feel appetizing. They feel disgusting. Wait, you'll, you'll be surprised. You'll be converted. Yeah. Let's peel it open and see. Have a, have a smell. Yeah, it's good, actually. It's OK, isn't it? Yeah. So what you do with this is to pull out these fibres and have a chew on them. You will find. <laughs> it's not a joke, you see, in effect, you're sucking the, the starch off them. Now they're quite stringy. You can feel the sort of thick, glutinous nature mm. of the starch. I feel like that's doing me good rather than giving me a fabulous taste <laughs> sensation. It, it's a very plain taste, but very, very important starch. Mm. And if you think of the environments that Mesolithic people are living in, there's absolutely tons of this stuff. So you, you're never going to be short of this starch staple. The teeth that were found from this period in the Midden in Scotland have no cavities, but they are worn down. This implies that people did chew on tough foods like rhizomes. There's no doubt that experimental archaeology brings us closer to Stone Age life. But it's incredibly frustrating what huge gaps in our knowledge we still have. I can hold this axe, which is 8,000 years old, and yet I have no idea at all what it was called back then. We don't know what language was spoken, the names that men and women had for each other and for the things in the world around them. We don't even know what their skin colour was. In fact, one of the only representations of the human form from the first age of Britain is this 4,000-year-old wooden idol found in a bog in Essex, possibly left there as a gift to a long-forgotten god. The spiritual landscape of Stone Age Britain is murky to say the least, but there are tantalising clues. Buried under these fields in the Vale of Pickering in North Yorkshire, is persuasive evidence of ritual on the island of Britain. The valley was once a lake, and the surrounding area supported around 500 people, a large group by Mesolithic standards. Archaeologists found hundreds of shale beads by the lake's edge. Whether they're religious objects or just adornments, we can't say, but they do evidence a world where life was by no means just about survival. One of the most significant discoveries in the Vale was a deer skull with antlers still attached. The skull bone had been tampered with, pierced, so it could be worn as a mask. Some people say it was, they were worn on the head so you could go hunting red deer. Well, anybody who hunts red deer today will say, if you're going to try and get near a red deer, the last thing you want to do is carry this great big headdress on your head with antlers sticking out. So I incline to the view that in fact those antler frontlets are worn here for some form of ritual activity associated with hunting and not to do with actually going out and hunting. In most early societies, there is no distinction between the physical and the mystical. These landscapes would have been rustling with spirits and inexplicable powers. But this didn't stop men trying to play God themselves. The lake at the Vale of Pickering might be long gone, but we know from fossilised pollen that the banks were ringed with dense reeds, and in their day, they must have been almost exactly like these ones at nearby Hornsey Mere. The fossilised reed pollen was found together with tiny fragments of charcoal, and that tells us something significant about the men and women who lived there over 9,000 years ago. They weren't content just to be passive scroungers who eked out an existence on the edge of the jungle. They wanted to control their environment. At the end of the Ice Age, this whole area was covered with dense vegetation, and they resolved to clear it with one of the few resources available to them, fire. It appears that burning is taking place at regular intervals, burning of the reed swamp. Because if you burn the reed off, it then grows young shoots which are ideal for grazing. So it looks as if what they're probably doing is they're encouraging animals down to the water's edge by removing the reed, giving young shoots, and then they're probably hiding in the reed and shooting the animals from there. All the indications, therefore, are that it's right at the beginning of the Mesolithic that man is already manipulating his immediate environmental area. 
Despite clues like burnt pollen, animal remains and discarded tools, there are no complete skeletons from the Mesolithic. And so it's hard to step across the millennia and engage with individual human characters. But thanks to a freak of geology on a beach near Liverpool, we can get amazingly close to real Stone Age people. Here, we can quite literally see the footsteps of the past. Oh, look at it emerging, that's fantastic. While we filmed, the tide revealed the footprint of a Stone Age man. I can't quite believe it, actually, that that footprint is a Mesolithic come together. Uh, yes. It looks like it was made yesterday, but this imprint was made by a man who ran along this beach 5,000 years ago. If we look carefully, you would see that the heel impression is shallower than the toes. And that suggests that, well, you can imagine yourself, you are running, and so as you run, the front part of your foot is deeper than the heel. We know these footprints really are five to 6,000 years old, thanks to a technique called quartz luminescence dating. They've survived because 5,000 years ago, this area was a long stretch of mud flats. A Stone Age Brit ran along here on a hot day and the sun baked his footprint in the mud. Then the tides dumped layer after layer of mud over the dried print, sealing it for posterity. And eventually the process began to reverse. As the sea levels rose, the tides stripped away the layers of mud, finally revealing these ancient footprints. Because they're not fossils, just imprints in the mud, they only last for a few short hours before they're washed away forever. The human footprint represents, on average, 15% of a person's height. And so we're looking at a footprint, 26 centimetres, which indicates someone who was probably five foot six, seven. In other words, he's about as tall as I am. Oh. I'm just beginning to see here the outline of the toes. That is incredible, because look, those are, his, those are the toe prints. Yes, and he has long toenails, because if you think of it, Stone Age man didn't have nice, neat uh, nail clippers. <laughs> <laughs> now, we see from the position of the big toe that this is a left foot. And the next visible impression over there is also a left foot. The question is, where is the right foot? <laughs> Indeed. This is a later deposition of sediment. But if you look, there you can see the impression of the right foot, which hasn't yet fully eroded out of the sediment. I get a thrill every time, actually, when I come out and see a trail like this and put my hand into a footprint and reach out into the past. It's amazing, isn't it? Because they last for five or 6,000 years and then... And then they're gone. And then they're gone. Overnight. Despite their brief reappearance, a few footprints can give us a real glimpse into everyday life. By measuring the pace and the stride, it's also possible to calculate the speed at which a person was running. Oh, so how fast And again, he was, running, he was running at about five kilometres an hour, uh, three, three miles per hour yeah. across the then soft mud. I wonder why he's running along this stretch. If we look here in the same stratum, you can see the impression made by red deer. So he might have been herding it? Possibly. He might well have been herding it. Or hunting. Or hunting. Uh, because here, a skidding roe deer, the tail end of the heel, has made scratch marks oh, and then he's it. gone in like that and then see, he's yeah. pushed in with the front part yes. of the cloven hoof oh, and then see, he's... Yeah. That is an incredible thought, isn't it? That this... Women and children's footprints also appear, but few indicate running. It seems they came to the beach for a different reason. There is a strong suggestion, in fact, that the, the women and children were involved in gathering shell food or perhaps looking for eggs in the, in the reeds. But perhaps Gordon's most charming discovery shows how little human nature has changed over the millennia. There was, one might almost say, the, the conventional trail of uh, female walking along, collecting seafood. But then the 
close by there was a confusion of children's footprints. They were everywhere, higgledy-piggledy, as if while mum was working, the children were mudlarking one hot summer day 5,000 years ago. The hunter-gatherer way of life that had held sway for thousands of years was about to be eradicated. Despite being an island, Britain has never developed in isolation. Even in the Stone Age, the channel was more highway than barrier. Five and a half thousand year old axes made of exotic French stone have been found in southern England, evidence that we were part of a complex exchange network. But it wasn't just novelty goods arriving here. Wooden rowing boats packed with immigrants were also turning up. These immigrants brought with them new languages, new technologies, new ways of living. But possibly the most revolutionary innovation was farming. Farming started in the Middle East around 10,000 years ago, and it was physically brought inch by inch across the Northern Hemisphere until it ended up on these shores around 3,500 BC. Now, our evidence for that being a shift, not just of ideas, but of people themselves, comes from our genes. If you were to analyse the DNA of any modern native Brit, you'd find that between 20 and 40% of his genetic material was of Middle Eastern origin. In other words, a substantial number of our ancestors come from modern-day Syria, Israel, the Lebanon and Iraq. It's impossible to say whether the hunter-gatherers were forced to make way for the farmers or whether they were seduced by a new relationship with the land that allowed them to settle down. What's certain is that farming found a staunch ally in the British landscape. This is one of the most hospitable places on earth. The land is fertile and relatively easy to cultivate. There's a network of waterways that allows for good communication and the light, constant drizzle is actually perfect for agriculture. Implements like this primitive plough represent one of the most dramatic, demanding changes of lifestyle to have ever taken place on these isles. With the aid of tools such as this flint-edged sickle, Britain's first farmers introduced the crops wheat and barley. They established herds of foreign animals, like cows and sheep. But most importantly, unlike hunter-gatherers who moved between temporary camps, farmers settled down. But they faced a serious obstacle. To farm, they needed open land, the trees that had dominated the country for the last 5,000 years had to come down. It was a Herculean task. It's estimated that it took five generations of one family an entire century to clear just half a square mile of woodland. Archaeologists call the first age of farming the Neolithic. On land clawed back from the forests, people built Britain's first permanent homes. We'd have little idea what these were like, had it not been for a stroke of luck. In the 1920s, a freak storm struck the main island of Orkney and uncovered something quite miraculous. The gale blew away the sand dunes to reveal the homes of a Stone Age farming community who lived here 5,000 years ago. This is absolutely staggering. So this is one home here? This is one, what we assume, family unit. They're quite big. I mean, when you stand up here and look down in, they don't look that big, but when you measure them up, you know, they're sort of 60, 70% of the floor area of a modern two-bedroom semi, except they're all in one room. Now known as Scara Bray, the village consists of seven identical houses linked by corridors. 
It occupies an area less than half the size of a football field. The walls and furniture are made of stone. Only the roofs, which were probably thatched, are missing. Nosing around someone's house tells you a lot about family dynamics, and Scarra Bray is no exception. As you come in, there are two main beds, and the bed on the right is always bigger than the bed on the left. That one's quite small, though. So, I mean, you'd never be able to stretch out. No, no, they're not very big. Is that a male-female division? Well, that's the best explanation that's been offered in the sense of, you know, in the same, you see the same pattern in places like the Western Isles in the past, where the men's bed was always on the right and bigger, yeah. and the women's bed was always on the left and smaller. The beds had canopies over them, yeah, these pillars in front carrying, well, I presume skin canopies, like a four-poster bed, yeah? yeah? Just draped to keep the draft out and possibly drips off you. Because if you imagine that the roof is not absolutely watertight under all circumstances, it would be rather nice to have something over you and not have sort of dripping it on your head or whatever, yeah? <laughs> yeah. All the buildings are dug into one man-made mound. We can go through here. Yeah, yeah, we can get it. Oh, you really have to... <laughs> It's a right town. Yeah, absolutely. The houses are connected by passageways. They were once covered by stones, but these fell down long ago. They're very carefully designed so that they throw the wind away from the entrances. So as you come to the entrance into a house, the curve of the passage has thrown the wind yes. away from this doorway. Yeah, now this is very protected. Yes, yeah. Let's go through serious crawling. Yeah, As you crawl in, you get the impression that the inhabitants were house-proud people who wanted to impress their guests. You see how the dresser dominates your, your view of, you know, that's what you see of the house mainly. Yeah. Oh, you can, that's all that you yeah. notice. Yeah. A dresser seems a very modern phrase. Why do you know it's that? Well, they're storage units which occur in all the houses and, you know, there's no reason why people in the past didn't need storage just like us, yeah? And so they're dressers, and that's where you put your best china, just like we do. You know, that's where, so to speak, you express your wealth and your status. The house is full of items from everyday life. This grinding stone was found full of crushed up fish bones, which would have been used as winter cattle feed. In the centre of every house is an enormous hearth where a fire would have burned day and night. Just like modern homes, there are shelves above the beds. Exquisitely worked bone beads were found on them. Whoever carved these mysterious stone baubles was clearly reaching for some kind of geometric perfection. All these pieces suggest people had time for complex analytical thought and ideas of beauty. When you come somewhere like this, you're stepping into someone's house, and you can even step into someone's bed. When this place was excavated, it was full of beads and pendants, and because this is the female side of the house, immediately you're short-circuited into the life of an individual woman who lived here over 5,000 years ago. That's before the Great Pyramids were built. So you can imagine her at the end of a hard day, nursing her baby, getting it off to sleep taking off her necklace and putting it on her shelf that was specially built for her things. She had snuffed out her oil lamp made of fish fat and settled down to sleep here in the bed that would have been plumped up with heather and sheepskins and, wait for this, because remains of eider duck have been found, maybe lying under a covering of eider down. And if that sounds luxurious, how about an ensuite? There is a drainage system and it runs from the cell over there and appears to be that we're looking at indoor toilets. And when they did the excavations in the, in the 20s, they found stuff which they interpreted as, as human excrement in the drains. You go in there and there's a hole in the ground and the hole, it leads to a drain which is running under the floor. So, I mean, it seems very plausible. Don't you think it's kind of fanciful though that we just we assume it's a really well-designed house and we almost want there to be a loo in the corner. But you imagine that it's 11 o'clock, you know, on a winter's night and it's pitch black. I mean, maybe you don't want to go out through umpteen gateways to the outside. 
Yeah. yeah, so maybe indoor toilets are an essential part of just survival. Yeah, I guess if you've got the technology, use yeah, it. Yeah, I think so. Britain's Neolithic farmers did more than build permanent settlements. They put down roots, and for the first time, they developed a business-like relationship with the land they lived on. You can see why. Unlike hunter-gatherers who foraged and moved on, farmers turned mile after mile of woodland into wheat fields and pasture. They invested their blood, sweat and tears into the land. That's when society makes a shift. After all that work, you're going to want your children to benefit, not a bunch of strangers. To do that, you have to establish a lineage. And the most emphatic way of linking that bloodline to your territory is to display the bones of your ancestors themselves right on the land. It seems the bones of the dead had some kind of totemic power. Around 3000 BC, spectacular tombs appear all over Britain. This long barrow in West Kennet in Wiltshire is a 100 yard long burial chamber. Inside were the partial skeletons of about 50 people and dozens of artifacts from daily life. Building it was a massive undertaking. Gangs of labourers heaved stones weighing several tons into place. The people who built this didn't just want a convenient resting place for their relatives. To treat them just as tombs, I think, is a fairly simple take on, on the evidence. It's much better, perhaps, to treat them as, uh, these as a, as a territorial statement. Bringing together everyone building the mound is, is putting everything into it that represents them. The animals that they uh, look after, the animals that they hunt, the flint tools that they make, the pottery that they make, and bits of the human population as well, are all being gathered together, are being placed in this mound. It's a big territorial statement, and they're seeding the ground with their own identity. So this is the first time they're laying claim to what is theirs. Large tombs weren't the only way they made their territorial claims. Stone Age communities sought out prominent landmarks, like Hambledon Hill, that towers over the Vale of Blackmoor. But they didn't build castles or cathedrals to demonstrate their right to the surrounding land. They used rotting corpses. To our eyes, Hambledon Hill in its heyday would have seemed a very gruesome place. For miles around, you could have seen that the enclosure was covered with human remains in various stages of decay. Here, there would have been the bones and corpses of men, women and children, some mutilated, some half-eaten by animals. Archaeologists have found the bones of more than 100 Stone Age corpses that had once been displayed here. These are the remains of a young man who lived here 5,000 years ago. His bones tell a grisly tale. These cut marks were left on his upper arm when razor-sharp flint blades were used like scalpels to loosen the flesh from his bones. Similar marks were found on his thigh bone or femur. Someone has deliberately cut or loosened flesh from his bones. So why would they be defleshing the bodies? That's the kind of question that archaeology can't answer. Um, but we can say they are being defleshed. That may be in connection with cannibalism, um, which is never a primitive activity. It's a ceremonial activity uh, in almost every society where it occurs. Um, and uh, it may be to do with the absorption or the honouring of the spirits of the dead. If this young man was cannibalised as part of a long-forgotten ritual, only a small amount of his body was eaten by people. Most of his flesh was stripped off the bones by scavenging animals. There were a, a large number of dogs around on the site, and we found the remains of some of them. And the young man, whose body had rotted substantially, and really it was just his, his lower abdomen and his upper thighs and legs um, were joined together. Um, that mass, muscle mass, was dragged by dogs uh, into the ditch of the Causewood enclosure and was consumed there by the dogs, so that there is gnawing and tooth marks all over his pelvis and his uh, femurs. This jagged edge at the end of his femur is the result of dog gnawing. 
On his pelvis, you can actually see puncture marks where a dog sank its teeth in. What's striking is not just the nature of Stone Age funeral rites. It's the fact that they took place at such a prominent location for all the world to see. The remains of ancestors may have taken on some significance because uh, the, val the validation of your right to be on the land lay, rested in those remains. And indeed, it was possibly significant that you could point up the hill and say, Grandad's up there and that's why I'm here. It seems religion and ritual for Neolithic farmers served people's need to connect to the land. In Grimes' graves in Norfolk, they did this with Britain's first large-scale engineering project. Around 3000 BC, they dug 400 40 feet deep craters here. These were flint mines, but it seems they were gloriously whimsical. The stone dug up here with such effort was rarely used to make tools. It seems mining had a much more symbolic purpose. One of the most dramatic things about this site was all the chalk debris would have been up on the surface. So there'd been these big white mounds of rubble, which would have looked really intrusive in the landscape, would have really stood out. Below this modern entrance, one of the original mines has been restored to its Neolithic state. There's a main central shaft with small tunnels or galleries radiating out from it. What archaeologists found down here confirms that in the bowels of the earth, ancestral links to the land and religion are woven together. Far from being an industrial site, this was a temple. There's a feeling of you can't take out from the ground without giving something back. So they're putting a lot of votive material in the, in the bottom levels of the mine. What, what kind of things are being found in these places? Um, you get sometimes complete pottery, you get nicely worked flint axes that have never been used, and you get bits of human bodies, and they're being carefully placed in these galleries, perhaps as a religious offering to whatever deity res resided in the earth, whatever god resided in the earth. And it's the closest perhaps we can get to a prehistoric religion. You have to admire the sheer drive of Neolithic people. All they had to call on was their muscle and willpower. And yet they dug out caves, they built mountains, they cleared forests. In spirit, they were our earliest ancestors, men and women who wanted to live by controlling the world around them. But even the most dynamic of cultures can run out of steam. And in 2500 BC, these flint shafts were abandoned. Religious practice was changing all over the country. Displaying the bones of ancestors went out of fashion. The communal tombs fell into disuse. In West Kennet, this enormous slab was erected to seal the entrance, closing the door on the past. It may be that there have been some form of natural disaster, something like that, which causes people to doubt whether the ancestors are doing the job they're supposed to, yeah? And they lose faith in it, and maybe someone comes along with an alternative. It appears the British yearn for a grander, less claustrophobic religion. All over the country, stone circles appear. Some are a few yards across, Others span acres. It seems people were looking up to the heavens for their new gods. But these stone circles also doubled up as theatres of power. The archaeological evidence tells us the population was growing. Small family groups were coalescing into clans. Large groups could gather at the stone circle in a way that would be impossible in a mine or a tomb. The real leaders are no longer content with just being leaders of communities. You know, they want a bigger area and they start literally politicking to get a bigger area. The new tradition is the stone circle, where it's public theatre. The way you gain leadership is, you know, you're a performer on a public stage. The rituals performed at places like this are long forgotten. 
that the psychological impact of standing stones must have been overwhelming. These were the statement of a confident people. Unlike their hunter-gatherer predecessors, the relationship they had with the land was now on their terms. The monuments are really symbols of conquest. They're human beings conquering the land. They're, they're imposing their will on the land. We look at these sort of sites today and they appear peaceful, they appear sort of tranquil, they appear almost sort of mystical. At the time, there would be nothing like it known to the local population, so they would be as perhaps as intrusive and as shocking as, as the motorway is to us today or the, the airport of a nuclear power station. These stones have been ripped out of the ground and set up in completely manufactured positions. Men are sending a message to the earth. Now we're in charge. By 2000 BC, four millennia had passed since the island of Britain had formed. The hunter-gatherer way of life, subsisting on the edges of dense forests, faded away. Farmers colonised the country, and the seeds of our modern society were sown. They cleared the land and carved it up into territories. They prospered, and their stone circles symbolise this. The grandest example, Stonehenge, is a wonder of the prehistoric world. A magnificent feat of engineering, it is unsurpassed as a statement of man's ability to manipulate his environment. In the first age of Britain, its people had subjugated nature. In the second, they would subjugate each other.